Hello, everyone. Welcome to Community Bookstore's virtual event series. My name is Noah Mintz. I'm the store's event coordinator. Um, Community Bookstore is celebrating over 50 years in business, and we credit the continued support of readers and writers for this milestone. Thank you all so much for spending the evening with us. I'm thrilled today to welcome Annie Hartnett to celebrate the launch of her new novel, Unlikely Animals, in conversation with Lindsay Weber. We're also joined by cartoonist Amy Kurzweil, who will start us off with a live drawing demonstration. But first, to some housekeeping. We've enabled Zoom's auto transcribe settings. So if your version of Zoom is up to date, click the live transcript button at the bottom of your screen to enable closed captions. If you have any questions for tonight's guests, please click on the Q&A button, which is also at the bottom of your screen. Uh, we will be asking those at the end of the program. So please don't be shy. Please say hi in the chat, but the uh, our, our guests tonight will not be monitoring it. So you can say hi to each other, say hi to, to me. Um, I will also be posting a link to buy tonight's book and some other information in the chat box. Uh, one caveat for tonight's event is that we're all at the mercy of our home internet connections. So please bear with any tech issues that might arise. We'll try to resolve them quickly. And be sure to stick around for the whole hour. One lucky attendee will win a personalized drawing from Annie Hartnett herself. Um, and we have a great lineup of events planned for you this spring. So head over to our website, communitybookstore.net, sign up for our newsletter to stay up to date. I'm very pleased to announce that we have our first in-person event on the calendar since the beginning of the pandemic. On May 11th, Sheila Hetty and illustrator Esme Shapiro will be joining us to celebrate the release of their picture book, A Garden of Creatures, in our store's very own garden. Tickets are available now on our website. So now, a little about tonight's guests, and we'll get started. Annie Hartnett is the author of the novels Rabbit Cake and Unlikely Animals, which was released today. She has re received fellowships from the McDowell Colony, uh, Suwannee River Writers Conference, and the Associates of the Boston Public Library. She studied philosophy at Hamilton College, has an MA from Middlebury College, and an MFA from the University of Alabama. When she began writing Unlikely Animals, she was living in the groundskeeper's house in a cemetery. She now lives in a small town in Massachusetts with her husband, daughter, and their darling border collie, Mr. Willie Nelson. Uh, Lindsay Weber is a writer, editor, and co-host of the pop culture podcast, Who Weekly. She lives in Brooklyn, and her favorite book is Heartburn by Nora Ephron. And Amy Kurzweil is a New Yorker cartoonist and the author of Flying Couch, a graphic memoir. Her writing, comics, and cartoons have also been published in the New York Times Book Review, The Believer, Long Reads, Wired, The Verge, and many other places. She's received fellowships from McDowell and Jurassi writer, sorry, Jurassi Resident Artists Program, and she was a Shearing Fellow at the Black Mountain Institute and a Berlin Prize Fellow at the American Academy in Berlin. She's working on her second graphic memoir, Artificial, A Love Story. Amy teaches monthly cartooning classes for the public via her Patreon. So now without any further ado, I will leave it to you three. Thank you all so much for being here tonight. Thank you for having us. Um, Excited to be here, Lanny. Yeah. So thanks everyone for coming. This is so fun. Uh, I wish I could see everyone's faces, but at some point I'll scroll through your names. Um, so yeah, this is this is the day that this book has finally come into the world. Um, so we have kind of a fun plan for you because you have probably been to a lot of these at this point. Um, and I have kind of a lot of different things went into this book. And one of them was um, my friendship with Amy um, and her sort of changing my relationship to drawing, um, which many of you probably who are here have hopefully benefited from because I made a lot of drawings. Um, so yeah, let's talk about us, Amy, first. And then we will talk about the book. Lindsay and I will talk about the book. Um, and fun fact, we are all from Newton, Massachusetts. Um, Lindsay and I <laughs> grew up together. Um, well, we went to middle school together. That was the only, um, and then we went to different high schools. But, um, and then Amy and, and I never met until McDowell, but now. McDowell, which, which is where the story begins and also where your book underwent great transformation. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, so let's talk about I guess I can tell what I've been telling everyone about how um, how Amy became such an important force in my life. Um, so we were at McDowell, which is if you've not heard of McDowell, it's a, a place 
where you where are different artists um, of many disciplines come together and they're sort of put up in um, separate cabins and famously delivered picnic lunches every day so that they work all day. Um, and then at night, you come together and you have dinner. Um, and that's where Amy and I met. Um, and I'm not a person who likes if I have the ideal situation, which I had at that time pre Leora, my child, um, and at McDowell where you work all day, I, I would I would prefer not to work after dinner. Um, so uh, I did not. And one night, Amy and I were just hanging around on the couch. And I said, you know, you have my dream job. Or maybe I even said this to you the first night. I was like, you're the coolest person here. <laughs> um, when I was you a kid, you wanted to be Yeah, you wanted to be a cartoonist. I wanted to be a cartoonist. Yeah. And I was like, you are like, you're, you are my most famous celebrity that I've ever met. <laughs> uh, she's in my phone as Amy Kurtzwell, famous cartoonist. Um, and there were a lot of moments where I kind of just kept just thinking that you, and still just think that you're the coolest. Um, so <laughs> one night I said to Amy, um, if I could ever, you know, see your process, how, how it works, because I just, I love, as we all do, love New Yorker cartoons, but just don't know how they're made. And I kind of thought they were made on the computer. And I was like, but you're at McDowell and there's computers aren't really a thing. So what are you doing? <laughs> um, and she very generously um, brought her supplies to dinner and one night and showed a bunch of us how to draw and like sort of the whole, the whole, the process you go through both like from pencil to ink to ink wash, although now she uses watercolor. Um, and then and that kind and then we drew every night for a while, even at, even after Amy left, a couple of us still still got into drawing. And it was really useful to me um, as like another creative outlet, as something I could start and finish when I had been working on this book for years. Um, and then uh, and then I'll I'll let Amy kind of take over, but because I want you guys to see her technique. But then um at the end of um the book writing process my editor sarah said you know i i want i think there should be a map in front of the book and your agent said that you can draw and i and i even though i didn't think i really could do it i was like yes i want to do that <laughs> because that would be sort of fulfilling a dream so i mean i hopefully a lot of you got the book today but some of you probably are still waiting on it and some of you may not have decided whether or not you're getting it and maybe this is going to be the deciding factor. It's <laughs> um, so it's a uh, it's a map in front of, in front of the book that I that I drew using Amy's techniques and and um, asked her advice a couple times, um, and I'm like so like I get a chill every time I look at it. Um, and then after that, the last piece of my art story is um, at Hanukkah time a someone put on that their husband had pre ordered the book for her and he had drawn to give her something he had drawn the cover with crayon. And I was like oh that's so nice to get something physical when you're pre ordering a book that's not out for like what, six months or so. Um, so I was like I could do that I could draw for people um, and so I inspired by that I started drawing for people for pre ordering the book and uh, I've made. 439, although I've made two for a lot of people. So I really I want to get my drawing. My... drawing. I want to get my drawing that you made me off the oh, fridge. Okay. Hold on. Um, yeah, Lindsay's is good. There's the fox. Um, and a lot of you, I wish you could all hold them up. Um, so I made two for a lot of people. So I do have to go through and like actually mm -hmm. count how many I've really done. There's this, this skunk on the surfboard. That's so um, good. <laughs> so um, and a lot of people have framed them, so that is pretty awesome too. It's so more immediate than writing, which I've been writing this book forever, and finally you guys get to read it. And I mean, you could put it in a frame, but that would be weird. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, Amy, do you, yeah. you want to walk us through the thing that sure. changed my life? Well, I just want to say two things about Annie first. One is like the memory of of her just absorbed and kind of like the revelation she had when she saw, especially the wash part of this, just how she was like, oh my God, I'm doing it. 
that was such a <laughs> such a beautiful moment for me so that was really fun um Annie's like a really good student she comes to my monthly cartooning classes and <laughs> she's She's great. Well, Amy is a really good teacher and is like the most positive art teacher that I could have ever asked for. And yeah, the reason good. I stopped drawing was because I had, <laughs> and I don't blame her for this because I, this was actually, I think helpful, but I had an art teacher that told me at the end of senior year that she knew I was super serious about art, but that I was a much better writer than I was an artist. And mm -hmm. so I was like, oh, well. The poison of that. Yeah, well, it was. Yeah um but it was well, helpful because I was like oh she thinks I'm a good writer and no one had really told me that right. so. <laughs> well, the other thing is like just watching you get better at drawing as you commit to this like really inspiring amazing project of like I want to physically make something to all the people who are pre-ordering my book I just feel like that shows so much like you can just tell I can also tell reading the book like, there's just so much of your heart in it and this is mm. like another example of that and so it's really cool and it's cool to see you get better at drawing I mean that's the only way to learn to draw is to just give yourself an impossible number of drawings to do and that's really the only the yeah only I had a friend who said it was <laughs> And I, I didn't know what he was talking about, but he said it was your, your Beatles 10,000 hours, like the Mal Malcolm Gladwell yes. did 10,000 hours and, um, and the Beatles, I guess, worked like played every night in Amsterdam for five hours at a time. And that's how they got so good, according to me. Yeah. But. Yeah. I mean, I didn't really know how to draw very well with my first book. And then I drew every page at least twice. And by the end of it, I was like, all right, I can do this, you know? So next up for you is a graphic novel, I think. <laughs> Maybe in like three books. <laughs> okay, I guess I'll get to the lesson so that we can get to talking more specifically about your book. Um, so I'm going to turn on my drawing cam. Hopefully it still works. And basically I'm going to show you guys uh, more or less what I showed Annie at McDowell. Although I'm fast forwarding a little bit because uh, so that we don't run out of time. So basically I drew this fox after this fox on the cover, this guy. I love how he's like strutting. <laughs> it's like, he's kind of posing, like looking back. So I, I just penciled this just uh, with a light mechanical pencil. And now I'll show you my magic tools. So this is a brush pen, which is easy to find on the internet. It's got a, it's like easy to control, but it has sort of the line weights of a brush. Um, and then I also use like thinner multi-liner pens that have a more fine point. And basically I just think like, if you get variation into your line, your, your drawing is gonna look a lot more sophisticated. So I like to use at least two tools. And it's nice that one of them has this, this sort of variated line quality. Um, so, I'm gonna use less lines than I used for the pencil because with pencil, you're sort of finding the image. And then once you put ink, it's like you choose one line that you wanna to commit to and, and fill it in as, as simply as possible. Okay, so I'll be quiet while I do that. There's a giant bug in right in this room with me. <laughs> oh, no. um, also, whenever I'm inking, I've sort of like, I try to finish the line with like one stroke rather than uh, getting caught up in any kind of fussiness. And sometimes I take like a deep breath with every line. I feel like drawing and breathing are connected. And then anything that's a little more detailed, I'm gonna save for my for my other line. My other pen. Okay. You have to let this dry. That's like one mistake is uh, smudging while you ink. So like usually whenever you're doing a page, you want to like start in the corner and move down. Unless you're a lefty. Right, you wanna like <laughs> work with your, whatever hand you use. And then if you have to go quickly, like if you're doing a drawing demonstration, you just wanna like make sure that your hand doesn't smudge. 
Okay, so I'm using this this line for the feet because I kind of wanted to get like a little bit of the details of the paws in there, which is harder to get with that thicker line. And then the nose and the mouth. I feel like the mouth is important because I want to show that this guy's kind of sly. So there's like a tiny smile. And then the eye is important too. Okay. Cool, easy. All right, so then I would let this dry even more and then I would erase the pencil with, this is a gummy eraser, but you can use any eraser, but you just really wanna make sure that it dries first. Um, and so for the sake of time, I'm not gonna erase the pencil. I'm just gonna go to the next step, which is the magic step. <laughs> this is what blew my mind. Changed so, my life forever. The way that Annie learned it was like using ink um, and creating, adding drops of ink to water to create washes. And I'm using watercolor, which is, which is similar, but it's like a slightly different technique. So I have some water here and I have this black, this is a shade of black watercolor. And I can make, make these sort of like mini washes here and add water if I want it to be lighter. And then I might like wipe it off on this and I can always test what color I'm getting like down here. I can make it darker by adding more of the watercolor or I can make it lighter. All right, so you have all these different <clears throat> options. And so I'm going to, let's see, how do I want to fill this guy in? I guess I'll do like a light wash all the way around, except for the parts I want to leave white. So Annie, the reason why I like watercolor is because you can almost erase watercolor. Oh, like, really? You kind of pick it up by getting lots of water on your brush, and then you can sort of pick up the um, if you don't you love that she even she knows right now that I want to learn from her. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god, it looks so good. Okay, so yeah, it really it, like, like brings it immediately to life. Yeah, it's kind of amazing, right? It and is then like, you can always put little like shadows under. I always feel like a tiny little bit of shadow underneath something just like uh. it. It's like and watching then, a dead person come <clears throat> to life. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then I would want the little feet to be darker. So you should become a YouTuber. You should put this on YouTube and just yeah. I'd watch it every night. That's the way to make money. See, that's this is like a Twitch thing. Awesome. You should do live drawing on Twitch. I feel like I that's people, now the the place. Yeah, people I have video. not heard of Twitch. Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. It's like we're used to watch people play video games, but this is much more interesting, I feel like, than that. Did you see how I just messed this up? So now I'm like going over it with water to try to pick up the extra. Oh, uh, my, my sister-in-law says TikTok would go crazy. There's a lot. Yeah, there's lots of cartoonists on TikTok, I think. And that would be cool if I had. Like, oh, definitely. More how do I not know Twitch? Because I, I don't know, I've never heard of that once. It's, I would have told you that was a dating app. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, anything could be a dating app. Okay, so I'm basically just adding like a little bit. If you have more shades of gray, it gives a sense of volume. And then you can also add like a tiny bit of texture wow. to show that he's got fur. Okay, that's basically it. It's, it takes like, it takes a, you know, a few seconds to bring it to life. So cool. Well, thank you so much for showing it to us. Yeah, that was so great. Um, mm -hmm. So let's and talk I'm gonna about- keep, I'm gonna keep drawing, so anyone yeah, else- so for people that are, that are super interested in this part of, you can pin her video because it will just stay small, but she's gonna draw 
Um, Amy's going to draw while Lindsay and I talk about the book. So um, you have my full permission to just look at the drawing and l listen to us. Um, Please. We like beg you to just look at the drawing. That oh, well, would be. <laughs> I did um, coordinate my outfit to the book cover. So I, you can look at me too, but no, you can look at I'm Amy. sorry. I didn't coordinate. <laughs> But I've had this for a while. I had, you know, I, I read this when I first got it on my Kindle. I read it immediately. Um, yeah, I, I was thinking about, remember the back of magazines where it'd be like, learn to draw. And you would like send away for a package and some, I don't know, I never did it. But I was always like wanting to draw like whatever apple or chicken they had. And it was like, didn't seem like a scam. But like, why were they, why were they advertising in the back of magazines? Am I the only one who remembers this? It was like a very distinct part of my childhood reading magazines it, but I don't know what I don't, is, so. <laughs> <laughs> it was like very yeah I think it was a turtle like I think it was a turtle anyways oh. that I see the comment Michelle, um Michelle I also ball. never really learned to draw either but I obviously there's always time <laughs> to learn yeah yeah I mean I, it's Amy's um class is when it's ten dollars a month and it is amazing once a month and it's super amazing it's like a great community and she's so encouraging um okay i'm gonna come it's so, lefty, it's so fun I've it's always just been like a, and and it's and there is um you don't have to be like good it's just kind of a, a way of expressing yourself that i think is really cool um and and it's also a new way to express humor which is something you and i are both interested in expressing uh, humor <laughs> yeah well you know creatively not just like um so the book um so let me just tell you what the book is about um many of you have probably not read it yet um and so and it is a kind of hard book to describe and i'm not going to read it tonight because we um if you want to hear me read you can come tomorrow to pals and i'll read some then but because we have the cartooning demonstration we just don't have as much time um but the book is about a, a young woman who returns home to small town New Hampshire to take care of her father who is, is dying from a mysterious brain disease. Um, and he has been suffering um, from these hallucinations. Um, and yeah, that's the basic premise of the story. And then I guess I'll let Lindsay ask some questions about yeah I mean it's funny because it just feels like yesterday that we were in person talking about your first book which I think now was like a lot of years ago but it doesn't Five feel that long ago, ago. almost exactly that's yeah. nuts um but this book like it, it didn't not remind me of your first book but there's a lot there that overlaps in terms of theme I mean always there's animals always there's mortality here you almost expand on both like it's like both are taken to the next level in a way I mean I, I when I was reading it I was interested because your first book was like a straight up novel but this book is really bleeds into real life and maybe you want to talk a little bit about what exactly is from real life and what isn't and what made you kind of decide to pull from real life in a really distinctive way Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, I had written that first book, which had a very strong first person narrator that I had to kind of get out of my head in a lot of ways. So I, I, I wanted to try like to write a third person book and to write something um, that had a more, <laughs> this is not a dig at rabbit cake, but had a bigger plot. So I always say about rabbit cake that like, because you love that first person narrator so much, you, you, nothing, it doesn't really matter what happens. It's just about following that character. Um, but I wanted to write a novel that had a bigger plot. Um, before I, so when I was at the University of Alabama, I had a professor who said, you know, before you leave here, I know you're still working on rabbit cake, but I think before you leave this like super cushy environment, you should start a new book. Um, so I started a book over a couple of weeks um, that was about fifth graders and um, a teacher um, in a small town. And then I put it aside because I still had so much work to do in Rabbit Cake. It was just he wanted me to have something on the back burner so I could know that I had something you know, else in case the first book didn't work out for whatever reason. And then as I'm starting 
to work on that trying to rabbit cakes out and it's done I can't touch it anymore um so I am starting to work on that other project and I just had it was so dead to me I just didn't like it and I I thought and I talked to Tessa Fontaine who is here tonight who's whose memoir the electric woman everyone should read it's so good um and we t we were talking about second books and tessa said to me like is it just is the first cut the deepest and like you'll never care really that much about you just have to kind of go on and keep writing because that's what you decided to do with your life not because you have that sort of passion that we had we both had with the first um so then i'm up visiting I'm, so I'm working my way through that project, but I'm not happy about it. And then I'm up visiting friends, um, Chris and Courtney, who are also here tonight, even though I had, they had a baby literally four, four days ago. <laughs> um, and visiting them in, they had just moved to real Newport, New Hampshire. Um, and we are driving around, I think we were getting a Christmas tree. And we're driving down this road and it's, this small town outside of Sunapee and there's trees on either side, there's a covered bridge, there's a pond. And then all of a sudden you look up on this hill and there was this enormous, beautiful yellow mansion. And I was like, is that a spa, a hotel? What is that? You know, like, can we go there? And there were no trespassing signs all over it. And our, our friends who had recently moved there didn't know what it was. So we went home and I Googled like huge yellow mansion, Newport, New Hampshire. And it was um, this robber baron had moved up, the Gilded Age robber baron had moved up after he had made his millions um, to where the town he was born in. He was born in Newport, New Hampshire. Not, and this, this part, part of the story, I don't know if it's true, but I love it, so I'll tell it anyway. He, apparently he knocked down the house he was born in except for the room that he was like birthed in and then built the mansion around that, which I think is so creepy and awesome. And then at, from there, he, I find that he bought up 60 farms in the area and built, fenced in as his retirement project and 26,000 acres and then stocked it with animals from all over the world. And I'm like, this is amazing. And I just stumbled on it. And I'm like, you know, so obs instantly obsessed. And, but I don't write historical fiction. I like to like sort of, you know, tell wry jokes and tell like, I like my characters to use cell phones. And it just wouldn't, I, I don't think my, I know mean, I like historical fiction. It's my talents wouldn't be at their best use if I were try try to write historical fiction. So I didn't really know what I was going to do with it. But then I find out that the park is still there and it's still totally intact. 26,000 acres. It takes up parts of five different towns and it's owned by, um, it's sold out of the Corbin family after um, World War II and it became a private hunting park for these like 25 millionaires who each own a share. Um, and it's still there and people are, like, it's secret. But you can't go in there unless you're with one of the members. And it is, um, so that just has my sort of brain on fire. So I go to the historical society in the area and just start to like be like, what else can I find out about this place? Um, and so I'm sitting in the attic up there and look, flipping through stuff. And then I find this guy, Ernest Harold Baines, who was a real life Dr. Doolittle. Um, and he was the naturalist for the park from 1904 till 1925. And he was, um, he had animals living in his house. He had a bear, an adolescent bear. He had um, foxes. He had um, two tame bison who didn't come in the house as far as I know, but he did have a deer that came in the house and he had like songbirds coming in and out. Um, so at that point, I'm like, I have to write about him. I was already writing about um, a man, uh, a woman who was coming home to take care of her father and then she was going to teach it at the fifth, the fifth graders. And so it wasn't like that big a leap then to think, okay, well, the father could be hallucinating and he's got this ghost friend. So Ernest Harold Baines at that point became a ghost. I'm going to show you, I'm going to do a quick screen share um, of... The, yeah, you, so you have, you know, the narrative I'll that you're telling you about my whole desktop well, about yeah. the girl coming home, but you also have 
writings from this guy. Oh, you have a messy desktop. I know. That I you know. Usually, shameful. I can just I can just show the um. Oh, God. Boy. Yes, I'm sorry. Um, I can usually just show the slideshow, and no one has to know my dirty secrets. Well, guess what? You, know, <laughs> you just revealed it. Um, and now where do I go to? Uh, this is where I always want to. Um, Clay from, from start. start. Um, so this is the yellow mansion. Um, and that's my picture. That's like the view that I saw, wow. uh, except probably to the, to the right is like the no trespassing sign. And that's an aerial view of just sort of, sort of how cool this place is or huge. And, and behind it is just trees you'll see. Um, and then this is Ernest Harold Baines with his fox. Um, and he was a very, so this is the other thing that I found out that I had to write about it because he's hot. Um, he, well, cause he's hot and I just love hot men. No, um, he, so I'm, I'm, I'm start asking people in town about this guy and I'm at the library and I'm asking the librarian what she knows and someone else in the library sitting at another table, not, not d doesn't work at the library, just leans over and goes, Ernest Harold Baines, he was quite the womanizer. And I just love that. Like, I'm talking about someone from 1925 who's just, you know, he's not famous and it's, but this small town gossip like carries on. Um, so he was always at the Cornish art colony up the road. He, he lived in the wild in the house with his wife. So was, she was home taking care of the bears and he's down the road at the Cornish art colony with like the female sculptors. So um, this is his bear, Jimmy the bear. And this is Jimmy on in a canoe. So these were all in public domain. So I'm able to put these in the book and some of his writings. So he's a ghost in the book, but throughout the book, like it's just a little texture. There's his little stories um, so that you get some of that history. Um, this is Dauntless. He had two wolves, Death and Dauntless. Um, there's the chickadee. Chickadees songbirds were sort of the thing that made him famous at, at the time. Um, he, he was, and bison and, and songbirds were the things that he really worked to protect. Um, that's his fox, who's a character or sort of, he shows up in the book. Um, and then there's the bison that um, he, it was really instrumental in saving. Um, he helped form the American Bison Society, which brought them back from extinction um, or the brink of ex extinction. And that's his wife with a deer. Okay. No, I'm, you can't see my computer anymore. <laughs> Stay out of there. Um, so so that, you know, was sort of my, became then my passion project. And now um, uh, I, this, Amy said it, like, there's so much of my heart in this book. Like I do consider this book as like my heart and soul. It's, it, I put everything into this book and 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 maybe it's because of there's so much research but there's also i mean it's really a story about this um the family that's going through this um the crisis of the father dying and then what's going on with the brother um but the, the ghost stuff is is was really fun to add to i guess book. just like how did you you know like decide what would be fiction and what wouldn't like i guess that's kind of what interests me you know because it is one of those things where you're told from the beginning that a lot of this is true, but you're kind of not sure what, but it feels mm -hmm. like so much of it is true that by midway, you kind of just have to let go with that thought process of like what's true and what's not in a, in a way and just mm -hmm. let it wash over you. I think yeah. you do a really good job of kind of saying like, this is somewhat true. So, you know, like to get the reader to trust you to go, to go with you on it. But how did you decide kind of like, because I assume you also felt like you had a little bit of like connection to tell the true stories, but then also, uh, you know, selfishly, you want to tell them funny, you want to tell them you, you want to tell them the way you want to tell them. So like, yeah. how did you kind of distinguish? Yeah, I mean, I wanted to to tell I, the stories of, of the ghosts and his animals, but I also wanted it to work with my my own, like the story I'm trying to tell. Not I don't want to let the history get in the way of a good story, which is... Um, what the the ghosts who narrate so there's there's two ghosts that the oh there's a bunch of ghosts there's the ghosts there are ghosts who narrate the story that are the residents of the graveyard and they sort of are able to connect the past to the present because they're sitting there in the graveyard and they care about everything that's going on um and they they would know about the gilded age and they would know about 
um, you know, 2014, because they're sitting there watching us. Um, and so adding the ghosts as narrators, who it's, it's sort of an our town um, feel, does allow me to both bring in the real history when I want it, but I never, as a writer, like, I don't care. I'm not ever trying to get to something that is, I'm not trying to stick to the truth. I don't, mm -hmm. um, I wouldn't say something about someone who was real that was like blatantly untrue. If, if other people hadn't confirmed that Ernest Harold Baines was a womanizer, I wouldn't probably, well, I don't know. I may have like, <laughs> you know, he's dead. I, I don't think he's, if he wants to come haunt me, like bring it on. Um, but things that Be I careful. did feel that I had to say, even though Corbin, Austin Corbin, who was the guy that started the park, he's not really in the book at all, except there are a couple mentions of, you know, of him. Um, he was a horrible anti-Semite. And so I did have to say that at some point. I didn't want to leave that out because he was, um, he's been a, so he was like founded Coney Island because his, he had one son who was, um, he had two sons named Austin Corbin. The first one that was born um, was sickly. And so he took him to the seashore and he was at where Coney Island is. And he was like, you know, what would be great here is like big hotels. So he built two big hotels and then, um, and then his son did not make it. Um, and that was, but that was the beginning of Coney Island. But then what I think is so weird is so the son died and three weeks later he had another son and he named that son Austin Corbin as well. And I know that was more normal then, but for me, it's like, Ugh, don't you want to go out with like a, you know, yeah. isn't there another name in the bucket? So there, so you do, so it is interesting because, so you do, you did feel a responsibility that if you're going to say, if you're going to talk about some thing and you know, this glaring anti-Semite is part of the history of it to mention, oh, this guy, not a great guy because I'm going to mention him or whatever. So it is interesting, like what you choose to like, make sure has grounding in history because it existed and what you're like, you know, I don't need to worry about that at all you know but it seems like um harold's life was fanciful in a way that it almost is like fiction itself like it's too crazy to be true so even the things that you're learning about his life that are real are like like great in a way like kind of hard to believe so yeah. only the residents of that town are like oh yeah that guy like he was he was a nut like he did this he did that like hearing it out of context of that, you know, it's kind of like allows you to be free in your telling of his, yeah, I mean, of I his story. Yeah, I mean, I sent those excerpts to Marika, our friend, who is a oh, um, yeah. Gilded Age expert. She's a historian. I did not and, know that. Yeah, and so she read it and she said, you know, he, and I didn't want to get things wrong. And she said, well, he was definitely a guy that did not like play by the rules of society. That he was supposed to be, he was an atheist. Um, and he had no children and a house full of animals. So she was like, you don't, he didn't play by the rules of society at the time. So you don't have to worry about it that much, um, which was useful. I always like it when people tell me I can do whatever I want. Um, but also these ghosts that are in the town telling the story that is the main story about um, about the the woman who's come home to take care of her dad and find her way and, and deal with this. Um, deal with what's going on in her family. Um, the ghosts are telling the story as, as an our town thing, as I, as I said, and I got it from, from being at McDowell where our town was, was written by Thorn Wilder, um, that they uh, have been watching history go by like kind of like we watch television so there's one joke at a point where someone says like well what about women who lift cars off babies it's one of the ghosts that says that and then it says look well, she lived before that invention of the automobile but you know she's st we stay up on current events so so they the ghosts that are that are in the story ernest harold baines he's like he's his character he's not just the person that he really was um and the ghosts that are in the cemetery they are very yeah. much entrenched in 2014 life even though they have some of them have been dead for you know two right years. like the ghosts are really all really funny which I think is really interesting it's like you gave them all a sense of humor which even if maybe they didn't have one when they were alive like the idea of being a ghost is hilarious and like therefore their lives in this like small town just like watching everything has made them with age 
be funny, what, like, which is funny. And also I love the kind of, when you introduce a supernatural effect in a story, you have to give the, you have to give rules. Like mm -hmm. it doesn't make any sense if there are no rules. So you had to think like, in my story, ghosts act like this. They, they can't go here. They can go here. They can say this, they can communicate like this. Where did you, were you inspired by like other ghost stories you've read or just kind of, you were like, I want to create ghosts that act in a way that serves my story very specifically, even if they mm -hmm. don't match kind of what other people think of ghosts as being like. Yeah, well, I wanted to write a story that was, um, I, I was really, in, I so I wrote Rabbit Cake and when people read it, some people said, you write like so-and-so, you write like so-and-so. And, and one, per, one name I kept hearing was you write like John Irving. And I had not read any John Irving at the time, which I felt really embarrassed about, but I hadn't read any of them. So I read Garp first, and then I was like, oh man, give me more of that. So I read Owen Meany, and then I read like six others. And, and I thought, you know, I can see what people would, how people would see similarities because we both have a dark sense of humor, but I love the sort of expanse of his, his novels and how he plays so much with coincidence and how um, one, one, there's so many different parts when you get into the beginning of a John Irving novel and then they all, especially I think Owen Meany, they all come together in the end. And you think like, oh, that is just a weird side story. And then it turns out to be something that has comes to play in the end. And I just love that because it's just such a big magic trick. So I mm -hmm. wanted to do something like that. And so the first the first drafts that I wrote about of this were about all these different things I'm interested in, like this town and and these um, and the history, but also the brain disease and and the the woman who comes home to take care of her dying father is born with a slight um, magic touch in her hand. So she comes home to take care of her father, but she's no to this small town that she never wanted to go back to, knowing that she has this sort of like slight healing touch that the nurse said you know this baby cured my sciatica that's the first thing you find out about her um so how magic magic is it it's like it's sort of unclear um but she comes home to take care of her father knowing that no matter what how much touch she ever had how much healing power she ever had it's just not enough to save her father um so she has to come to sort of the realization like this sort of ant anticipated grief that she's going to lose her father um and that also she sort of her mother really wants her, her to forgive him, her father because he's had an affair um and so they are i wanted to write that whole story with all these different like the main family story and then a lot about the small town and i wanted it to feel like sort of an 80s 90s movie with like like fried green tomatoes or something that's like or steel magnolia magnolias that's like so much about like a large cast of characters that everyone's got quirks yeah. and it's just and you get to know everybody and you feel like you live there for so it was this huge it was this omniscient narrator which is something that john irving uses in some of his his books um and then my friend lucas said well but this omniscient narrator has so much personality and keeps telling jokes and like that's kind of against the rules like who's talking Mm. Um, and so at that point, I, I was at McDowell meeting Amy, getting my life changed. And I, I saw, I, I, when you get there, they sort of hammer home, like, this is a, amazing, like geniuses have walked this place and like, you know, don't waste your time here because it's so special that we picked you and that, you know, there are all these other people, like they talk about James Baldwin and, and Thornton Wilder wrote Our Town there. So at that point I was like, well, I could try that because since I have so many things that go into this novel already, because I wanted to write that John Irving, like all these little pieces, and then it comes together in some big way in the end. Um, so I had the plot all done, but I needed some way to really make it gel together and to sort of, so I tried that Thornton Wilder type Our Town chorus, although there there goes that they, they do pop in, but I wanted um the mothers by Britt Brene was super helpful because what I liked about that book is that they have the the church mothers who are telling the story mm -hmm. but then they don't get in the way of the story so they have their like sort of voices and their opinions but then they back up and they're just like let me just tell you the story um so that was useful to me in so much of so, some of it just feels like this is just an omniscient narrator but then then they'll pop in and 
and have their opinions and tell their jokes. And, and they also offer a different perspective. So even though it's, it's a story about um, a family who is uh, dealing with some pretty serious stuff, um, the father dying and then the brother has been in, in rehab a couple of times, um, they, the ghosts have a different perspective on life than the living do. And so mm -hmm. it's, my goal is that it's a, it's a funny, novel and hopeful novel um and because it's so much about the ghosts it is funny and the people in the town um, it is funny and, and it is something what's funny is the ghosts are always kind of like don't waste your time you're alive you can do this you can do that you can eat a big piece of cake you can have sex you can do whatever like don't you know like don't fuck it up or whatever it's funny that you, you thornton wilder first of all it's such a it's such a um, theatrical use it's such a theatrical function that I just saw one of his plays it's at the Lincoln Center Theater right now the skin of our teeth which I'd never read or heard of in my oh, life and oh, yeah. it is so good and it's you talked about the passage of time it's he tries to capture the entire history of the universe in one three-hour play and it's about a family that has dinosaurs uh, coming into their house and you know Jesus walking and all this and it's just it's so funny how like our town is like his defining work, but he mm -hmm. was working with the same themes, like as you are throughout all of his pieces um, in different forms. So like, yeah. it is interesting that you're doing that as well, especially with like animals and like using animals the way that you do, like, you know, it's almost like a progression from your first book to have the animals the way that they are in this book. Like they mm -hmm. get, they get even more powerful in terms of telling a story. Like the dog even is such a like significant character in this book. And I feel like that's something only you could really pull <laughs> off where like there are people in this book that are not even as like personality driven as the dog or the fox or, you know, the, a bear at the end, like that type of those types of characters. And I feel like maybe you were inspired by the like personification of this guy's animals that lived in his house, you know? Well, or maybe that's how I've kind of always been. I've always had like, I've always been True. the person who would rather meet your dog than your baby. Um, right. So, <laughs> um, I think that it's, uh, that has been something that I was kind of self-conscious about. Cause I, I said, you know, to my agent and my editor, like, there was so many animals in, in rabbit cake and I just, animals keep leaking in. This is before I found the Dr. Do little guy. And I just, but it's just so much part and part of my imagination that, um, and they both said, you know, I don't think there would be any Annie Hartnett novel that doesn't have animals in it. Like, I think people would be disappointed. And so that was like, you know, I, like I said, I sometimes need a little permission for something that I probably was going to do anyway at some point, but mm -hmm. getting permission from someone I respect means makes things like probably saves me a couple of years. <laughs> um, I think I should take some questions or I see some questions. I should look at them. Let's see. Let's see. If All right. An, an, <laughs> an anonymous attendee. Wow. Well, I love this anonymous question. What kind of research did you do for this novel? I think we kind of went over that, but was there anything that we missed that you want to talk about doing research? I feel like you talked to a lot of people for this. Um, I yeah I did um, I mean the I think the part that I haven't talked about is that the book is there is the opioid crisis that's going on in this town and so as I'm writing like about this real town but also as I said I'm not really I don't feel like I have to um, tell like I'm trying to get to emotional truth I'm not trying to and I'm not trying to really even write about this town so much like I I I am very comfortable changing things for my own use um so and i changed the name of the town which um some people think is enough and some people are like well where's the library <laughs> um but uh so i uh i did as i was researching this town and spending time there and i did keep hearing stories of sort of like you know i i looked up in new england newspapers like what does when does this town show up and what's it for? And it's just like cast a big shadow over this town over the past several decades. So it, it kind of leaked its way into the plot first, um, that it was something that became part of, of two of the characters and sort of their stories. There's a, there's a woman who is, who is missing and no one's looking for her. And I was like, okay, why would no one be looking for her? And that was kind of an, that was an easy sort of 
reason why that um and it made sense to sort of like how the plot was fitting together and then the brother has has not left the town and he has a lot of resentment to it towards his sister and his sister is this healer who's supposed to be like have born been born to do great things and and she has been away in california not at home in in the town and while her brother is really struggling through this this stuff and so she has to learn how she's really failed him and kind of see that and then and then the brother character is really the one that snuck up on me as um to, and he became such an emotional force in the story and he's he originally just kind of was there for like the sibling jokes the sibling jabs and then he became a really um a a fully realized person and so much of the book is about the ghosts in the cemetery really want all the living people to have second chances and to take you know advantage of their life so what they love most is when someone gets a second chance whether it's the dad in the book or or the brother um so that for that point after i kind of wrote much of it i did have to do some research just to make sure that i was not getting anything sort of wrong or being insensitive anywhere um and so i had some friends that were super helpful at reading drafts um and also the books and documentaries were also useful so that was more research that i um had to get into or got to get into Okay, the next question is from Claire. I'm sure so much of this book must have been really hard work, but what was the most wondrously joyful part to write? Um, so much of this book is actually so joyful um, that in some ways it was just, and, and I kind of feel this about both my books, that I could have gone on writing them forever um, if I didn't feel like, the point is that people read them <laughs> um and i really desperately want people to read them and i really like i consider myself sort of a writer who's mostly interested in entertaining people um mm -hmm. that's my sort of number one goal is is entertainment and making people laugh and making people feel for these characters and these people and really um relating to them but um i i I mean, the research was so joyful that felt like such a gold mine of stumbling upon Ernest Harold Baines and then playing with his his work um, and being able to do whatever I wanted with it, but also keep the best like it's mostly his stuff, you know, my my agent one time made me like highlight what's actually his um, and it, it's pretty highlighted throughout, but I did sort of like take a sentence here and then delete three sentences and then take the next sentence. So the story is because he's just he writes like way more like I'm trying to make them as short as possible because it's only one aspect of the book. Um, but like who else would be read? I mean, it's like you're rev you're bringing this writing that who is reading this? No, nobody. I mean, like it's yeah. 2022. Oh my God, what year is it? But like the idea that you're kind of like recontextualizing his work, like it is hard to it's hard to disagree that that's something that is of value. It's hard to say like, oh, you know, like even though you're kind of like fictionalizing a little bit of his life, like whatever, it's just, I'm sure he would love that his writing that was used to essentially yeah. just like talk about his animals is now being, is part of like a new story. Yeah, yeah, I think he would love it. I mean, he had a really uh, good sense of humor and sometimes a morbid sense of humor. Um, but I also, uh just feel this is like the only thing i feel bad about as i'm publishing this book is that i didn't thank him in the acknowledgments and i just i'm like why didn't i i thank Th thornton wilder it's like why didn't i but i just figured because there was the author's note and there and there's a note and i mean he's the he's really a star of the book i don't i, I mean, know he really, but he uh... deserves to be in college and i've i've been thinking about it all day today and i'm like well paperback edition to like light him a candle or something i'm very thankful for him <laughs> So yeah, I, was gonna, I was gonna say, do you believe in ghosts? Uh, you, you seem to um, I, do grapple I believe, with that. Um, when I, my family took a family trip around Ireland when I was in fifth grade and um, my brother, I ran out of the red wall books that I was reading and my brother gave me his book, which is true Irish ghost stories that he'd bought in some, Perfect. and so I was, so scared for the rest of that trip. But the worst part about it, which I didn't even realize till later, is that, so I was in fifth grade, my brother is four years younger than me. And I told him like every detail 
And like, I was like, cause I needed someone to confide in. So I'm scaring this first grader <laughs> with ghost stories and I'm scared out of my skin. And I made up the story that I was like, every, we're the seventh cottage in this, in this, um, like, you know, I don't know what it would be called. It's like a rented cottage and someone is murdering, murdering a cottage a night. But it's okay because we're leaving on the sixth day and we're the seventh cottage, so we're going to be fine. <laughs> so I realized when he told me that a couple of years ago, I was like, oh my gosh, like I can't believe how I abused him. Um, so I, that is a, a way of not answering you. I'm not sure. So you don't know. So you're not clear. <laughs> Wait, okay. So we have one more question. Let me look at it. Hold on. Let's see. This is from Melissa. This novel deals with some heavy topics, but it's still so funny and lighthearted. Can you talk about how you balance those two things? Um, how do I so, like So, yeah, it is a, this is, I think, something that I, I, I think every writer has something that they can't not, like a, a tick almost. And I can't not make things funny. I'm always trying to find the lightness, even in like whatever dark thing I'm writing. I like to write about things that are, I like, well, death is really my, my, my thing that I'm, that I'm trying, trying to solve in my books. I don't know. Um, in, in many ways, I feel like I'm trying to solve death in both books. Um, or like what happens after death and, um, and why people die, you know, all those things that like are, are inevitable, but like still feel like we have to solve them somehow. Um, but for me, I guess through my family and the way that we always cope is like through humor and you kind of know everything's going to be okay as long as someone is telling a joke. And um, so it's so much my coping mechanism, but it's also one thing I like about writing is that uh, especially my younger brother is very like in your, he's very funny and in your face funny and like has sort of gets bigger laughs or especially we did when we were growing up. But I always felt like, but I'm like, quietly funny and nobody notices that I'm funny like because I always like have a little like like you know thing to say but like it's often under my breath or something um and that's what I liked about writing is that I could be um funny with and that people would notice it and then that so that was this the space for me but um I think also having I don't know what would have happened to this book if I didn't change it to the ghost telling the story because I always want a hopeful to get to a hopeful place. I want the characters to start out in a bad place and then work towards something better. Um, and so I, I really, um, but once I had the ghost that they understand like the stakes better because they understand what happens when we die, or at least what happens for a while after that we die, that they go, people go to the, the cemetery so that they can make jokes that otherwise wouldn't be. Right. Like they're only like, vaguely bummed about it they're just they're mostly yeah. like like oh that'd be nice to like experience that again but otherwise I'm having fun watching this television show that's like other people's lives while I'm just like chilling waiting for like <laughs> other new people to join us for yeah. our like television watching party essentially which to me sounds like kind of a ideal scenario you know you just become like a busy body eavesdropping very wise beyond your years deity or something like that okay we have one okay now we actually have one more question i think because we're hitting time um ellen wants to know who was your favorite character to write um so my favorite character is sort of without question is clive the father who mm -hmm. is the one who's hallucinating the animals or and moses the dog because the the, <laughs> the two of them are just so much fun but um clive is um he's based on he like i i take a care i take a, a when i'm trying to write a character especially a character with a big personality i need to take or has a big role like i need to take a lot of different people and put them in and so he's a poetry professor and he's um so my and he has a just huge personality and he's kind of like this uh fixture in the town and everybody knows him and and his family is sort of like oh it's clive again and so clive is um he's based somewhat on, on my father who's a very big personality life of the party type and that's where the life of the party um comes from with that but he's also based on my friend marika's growing up her dad who's like the eccentric environmental -ist, um 
professor. And so, but the t even the two of them, like mashing them together, doesn't make a whole person to me because I only like take a little bit. So he's also, the dad is also some Willie Nelson and then he's some Ozzy Osbourne who was like, Ozzy Osbourne <laughs> was super important to me as I'm writing the book. So the dad is the poetry professor, but then he's got, he's the lead singer of this Black Sabbath cover band, Blacker Sabbath. Um, right. And as as I wrote Rabbit Cake, my I I have always loved Dolly Parton, and so I would listen to the same like three or four Dolly Parton songs um, before I'd write. And then, like I said before, I had to really try to find a way to separate myself from Rabbit Cake so that I didn't keep writing that first person character forever. Um, so I was like, okay, who's the exact opposite of Dolly Parton? So I came up with Ozzy Osbourne. So I made Drew every morning listen to. Black Sabbath and, Oz and and his solo stuff. And that was like a routine we got into for a while. Um, so Black Sabbath was one of the things that like kind of set me free from, from the last book and let me work on this one. So I feel I probably should have also put Ozzy Osbourne in the acknowledgements, but he gets a quote at the beginning. I will, you think you're good. Yeah. I mean, he also, <laughs> there's also a little bit of a, of the later, the Osbournes reality TV show. In him yeah. As well. Yeah. Like, not even true. just like, not even just like he sings in a hardcore band. It's like the kind of forget forgetfulness and and almost cheeriness of a guy who's known for like making metal music is very much like the the vibe, like the the yeah, softness, yeah, yeah. the yeah. dependency he has on Sharon Osbourne. Of course, I know all this shit about right. him, but and only the, that, that show was on when we were in high school, and and um, mm -hmm. so that was one of the first. And um, I haven't watched that many reality TV shows, but that was one of the. Um, first reality one TV those. shows and one that I really did like. Yes. So. I think we've hit time. I want to though, look, can we make everyone make the drawing, Amy's drawings. I want to like make them huge on my screen to look at them before we sign up. How do yeah. I? Oh, yeah. oh my God. Oh, super hot. Go. <laughs> Tommy, oh my God. <laughs> oh my God. These are so, so fantastic. Good. Um, so good. This whole this whole evening has been super fantastic. Thank you, Annie, Lindsay, Amy. This has been a blast. Um, before we go, we have one more thing to do. We have our raffle. One lucky attendee in the room here will win a personalized drawing. So let's get that going. I have here a list of everyone who's with us tonight. And I'm going to click the button. And the winner is oh Michelle Michelle Ferrari. <laughs> um, so I will put you two in touch if you're not already in touch. Um, I know Michelle well. Great. So I, will, I will make her a drawing of her choice. Awesome. Well, congratulations, Michelle. Congratulations, Annie, on the publication of Unlikely Animals. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Um, this has been a blast. Those of you who haven't already gotten a copy of the book, please consider purchasing it from Community Bookstore. We hope to see you at another virtual or in-person event soon. And take care, have a great night. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Lindsay. Thank you, Amy. Thanks. <laughs>